Shabbat Shalom. Last Sunday, our uh, musical Shabbat davening team went to, were invited to do a concert at the Home of Harmony, a Hindu-based interfaith organization that is hoping to give the Chicago community a taste of all the different worlds uh, religion. And so we did a concert on Jewish music. And we played our joyous Friday night music. We played our more introspective Shabbat morning, a little Yiddish. It was lovely. There were lots of nine, nine, nines. And our uh, synagogue's very own religious school graduate, Owen Frankel, came and played the bass. And we created uh, beautiful music. And at the very end, there was a couple, a Sikh couple from Naperville who went all the way to uh, Old Irving Park for the concert, said how much they appreciated it and they wish we could do a whole other hour of it afterwards. And because music enhances prayer, music enhances prayer and it brings it to life. And this was the way that we used to pray back in biblical times when all of our religion was focused um, on the temple and on the, the, the right in the temple. In the temple, the music was exquisite. Maimonides, our medieval philosopher, wrote that at times there were 29,000 Levites singing and playing music in the temple. And the music was so powerful, he says, it could be heard all the way down by the Dead Sea in Jericho. And you could hear the cymbals and you could hear the flutes. And there was a whole class of the Levites, their whole task was to bring music and to serving the people. And it's why our Parsha says, take care of the Levite because they will not own their own holdings of land. Their role is just to inspire you. And they were, that was an integral part of what uh, we were about, how they could contribute to our society. And they needed to be looked after. And even in generations before the temple, before the temple was established, the book of Chronicles teaches that King David set aside the sons of Asaph, who would prophesy with harps and cymbals and lyre. And uh, Rabbi David Kimchi, the Radak, a medieval commentator, says, the sons of Asaph were chosen because when they would sing, the Holy Spirit would rest on them, and then they would communicate it to all those who would hear it. And so for a thousand years, when you approached Jerusalem, when you approached the temple, what you'd hear was the sound of instruments, the sound of music, the sound of singing. It would help all find the peace and inspiration. We, the, one of the names for the temple was Sukkot Shalom, the shelter of peace, because all who came to it felt peace. And even the prophets, as we read about in all of our books in the Tanakh, they had these visions and experiences in the temple as they were taking in the worship. And King Saul once encountered prophets playing music, and he too caught a prophetic state. And we know all of Israel would gather hundreds of thousands uh, for festivals um, and uh, for our pilgrimages in Jerusalem, hearing the sounds of the Levites and their instruments. And so five but five years ago, when our congregation went our congregational trip to uh, Jerusalem, and one of the uh, most important archaeological finds of the last hundred years is right there at the bottom of the southern wall, and they found a little corner between the western wall and the southern wall, a rock that fell and had an inscription that said, "Here was where the Levites played the trumpets." to announce the beginnings they think of Shabbat and festivals. So what happened to music? What happened to the beautiful music of the Levites and all the instruments? And why have we not played music in our synagogues for 2,000 years? So on one hand, there was a change in Jewish law and halacha. And there was this halachic worry that should the musicians, uh, one of their instruments should break, a string or another part of the instrument that they might be uh, moved to repair the instrument, which would violate the laws of Shabbat. So better not to have instruments at all. And perhaps even more so, the temples were destroyed and all the Jewish people were exiled. And so we decided there should be no more instrumental music out of a sense of sobriety and of mourning. 
the temple in the ruins, our people wandering the four corners of the world, the Levites dispersed. And so we turn from instruments to the power of voice. We'd always been a people connected to the power of voice. In Kabbalah, a human being is known as the Medaber, the one who speaks, which is different uh, than all other creatures. We believe that God created the world with divine voice. And in the psalm that we sing on Friday nights and after we return the to Torah on Shabbat mornings, we speak about God's voice flowing over the waters, thundering through the air, the voice of the Lord, mighty and powerful, the voice of the Lord, majestic, divine voice breaks the cedar trees, it shakes the wilderness, causes the hens to call the calf. In the climax of our Sinai experience, the founding moment of our people was hearing the divine voice speak to us, an impression that shook our voices, as the Midrash says, and transformed all of us forever. And so without a temple, with no more instruments, voice became the center of all of our worship, the rhythm without the sacrifices of all of our devotion. And we created elaborate chanting styles for different books of a Tanakh. We invented tropes to chant the different words, different uh, books of the Torah. And then we took on also all the musical traditions and styles of all the nations that we were exiled and that we visited throughout the world. Our chanting in North Africa resembled the Islamic cultures that surrounded us. And in Eastern Europe, we took on the sounds of klezmer, of the people's cultures, the folk traditions that surrounded us. And for the Hasidim of Eastern Europe, as they were seeking to revitalize our tradition spiritually, they said, we don't even need words. All we need is the power of the sound themselves, the nai nai nais, the nigun, and that could transport us back to the mountain as we've been trying to return for these thousands of years. And so in the Hasidic course, or even those who were the keepers of the nigunim, and they remembered all the melodies and kept them sacred. And there were some that were only sung once a year, if it was the Rebbe's birthday or some other occasion. And the nigunim were considered to be as powerful and as high as the inspiration of those who created them. And they believed that when you sung them, you could get a feeling for what the creator felt when they were inspired, uh, the place of spirit where they came from. And also in the Sephardic tradition, they created all kinds of powerful chants that they sing communally in rounds in uh, the synagogues throughout the service. And all the melodies express both our people's profound contemplation and even sadness of all the befell us the sorrow of all of it, but also our joy, Shabbat, holidays, festivals, all of it. And so now we're at a very interesting moment for our religion, where instrumental music is once again entering into our synagogues on Shabbat and holidays. And perhaps there's no coincidence after 2000 years with our people thriving here in America and back in our homeland, we're bringing back instrumental music into our worship for the first time in 2000 years. And yet today our music is even more enriched by the sounds of all the nations, all the cultures, all the lands where we traveled. And so at the Home of Harmony, our davening team as we do here, we played Sephardic melodies from Morocco, and we played joyful Hasidic nigunim and newer melodies that are only now entering the Jewish world using both the power of voice as we've done for millennia, but also enhanced by the sound of instruments and the skill of our wonderful musicians. I was remember as we were singing these songs and showing our Jewish heritage to the people there and to all the viewers from around the world, feeling inspired and uplifted both by the audience and clapping and singing. I remember thinking, how endless new wonderful possibilities are before us to bring our worship to life. And what a blessed time it is to be alive and to be able to experience it. And so on this Rosh Chodesh Elul, let us hope and pray that our worship, whether it is vocal or accompanied by the exquisite sounds of instruments as it was last night, will continue to take on ever more meaning and ever more inspiration for all of us here at Temple Har Zion, for the whole Jewish people in all the world. Shabbat Shalom, Chodesh Tov.